You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hello and welcome to uh, The Rusted Robot, Episode X, where X is the variable where the number is equal to the last episode it'll release plus one. That's right. Also, it is the date that it comes out, is the date that it's released. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Sean. I'm Josh. And we're here to entertain you with Sean's top ten favorite sci-fi movies. My name is Optimus Prime. Hello, I am C-3PO, Human Cyborg Relations. I am Locutus, a Borg. Resistance is futile. You're like a machine underneath, right? But sort of alive outside? I'm a cybernetic organism, living dish over a metal endoskeleton. You're not quite uh, human, are you? No, sir. I'm an android. These aren't the droids we're looking for. Counterfeit facsimile replica. We need some sort of robot. Ah, crap. I'm some sort of robot. What are your prime directives? Serve the public trust. Protect the innocent. Uphold the law. I your command. Uh, we've done mine. We've done yours. We've done Katie's. We have not done Katie's. No, I thought we did Katie's. We did not. I know she listed. We didn't record. We did not record uh, that yet. Okay. It's hard to get all three of us together all the time to do a bonus episode as well as a regular episode. Exactly. All right. So we're, we're doing Sean's this week. We're doing Sean's this week, whatever week so this is. So Sean did not organize his by, by favorites. He organized his chronologically. Yes. Yes, he did. All right. So what what is the first movie the f- in, in your list here, friend? The first movie in my list is from 1956. Do you know what that could be? Uh, I think I know. Tell me. Is it Forbidden Planet? It is Forbidden Planet, Josh. And why is it one of my favorite movies? Good question. Probably because it's eminently quotable. That is correct, sir. For your convenience, I am monitored to respond to the name Robbie. It is. Uh, It's early Star Trek, before Star Trek was a thing. If if you take a look at the film, you can see where Gene Roddenberry got his influences from. Uh, You can see that. There's there's a lot of them in there. Uh, It's got Robbie the Robot. Yeah. You don't like Robbie the Robot? Yeah, he's he's in too many things to be his own thing. But this was I, his first. Yes. But he's he's in too many things and he's cast as the robot. Yes. And I can't I can't have a robot that's in different series be the robot. I just it's weird. I don't like it. Okay. Well they, they may maybe they ruined him afterwards. But this was his first appearance and it was spectacular. He's got great lines. Nice climate you have here. High oxygen content. I rarely use it myself, sir. It promotes rust. The, the thing is, though, 1956. Yeah. I'm not born to 1981. They ruined him before I got to him. Uh, be that as it may. Yeah. Okay. See, if I had watched it in as the original Untouch, not knowing about Robbie the Robot appearing on commercials years later. Right. Because he was in the, uh, the Charmin commercials in the 80s, the Mr. Whipple one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, if, if I hadn't seen all of that other stuff... It would be more impa- impactful. It would have. Okay, I gotcha. Well, this movie also came out 20 years before I was born, so I didn't see it when it originally aired either. But uh, the first time I watched it, I, I can't even remember. Maybe it was a high school thing because uh, it was a alternate take on a Shakespeare play, either The Tempest or Taming of the Shrew. I can't remember which one it is, but uh, that's Shakespeare stuff, and I don't know those plays. Even though I'm an English major, I just don't care. You're an English major and you don't remember which play your favorite sci-fi movie was in? Nope. Based on. Yeah. Uh, no. But uh, Forbidden Planet, 1956. It uh, it also influenced uh, J. Michael Straczynski in his uh, Babylon 5 series. Because when you go down to the planet that the space station orbits, it's got the great machine, just like you see on the Krell planet from Forbidden Planet. And it's uh, it's awesome. I just love it. Okay. That's uh, the main actor. Uh, actually, Leslie Nielsen was in it. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Morbius was played by Walter Pidgeon, which is a cool name. It is. All right. So, next chronological movie. Next chronological movie is 1960, The Time Machine. Well, since... See, that's not right. Oh? That's, I can tell you that's not right. It's a time machine. Therefore, it can't be in chronological order. It can be anywhere in the list. It could be. However, this is where I placed it. And why did I do that? Why is it a favorite movie? Uh, you know what? It's, it's maybe a contentious choice, I guess, uh, because it's slow. It's definitely 1960. 
uh, it takes a while for the action to ramp up. But there's there's something about it that just speaks to me. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the it's the going back in the past, going back into the future, just time travel itself. Uh, it's it's the man, the main guy. I guess it's actually H.G. Wells in the in the film itself. He's invented the time machine, and he goes like to the year. 800,000 or something, and there's the Morlocks and the Eloy, and it shows how uh, civilization has collapsed and it's all underground, and the, the Eloy are these uh, kind of dumb, docile... They're sheeple. Sheeple, exactly. That's that's a good thing for it. You, you must have seen this film. Yeah, I've seen it. Lots. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I've seen it a few times. Yeah. I, I enjoyed it, but you're right, it's 1960s sci-fi, which was ponderously slow. Yes. You yes. watch any sci-fi from the 1960s, it, it is... Really dragging in spots. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, but there's just something about it that I really, really love. All right. Maybe it's the effects, which are super cheesy. I, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, it's the way the characters interact. But there's there's something about this thing that I really like. And, All right. And uh, since we, I think we decided that for our our sci-fi favorite films, we were going to go pre the year two thousand, right? We yeah, we're we're doing classic films rather yeah. than, than so modern. So it's it's hard to. Did did you like the new one? Uh, no, 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 I didn't. The one with Guy Pierce there from ten years ago or whatever. Yeah, I tried to watch it and I I think I did, but meh, it just it didn't do it for me. All right, but but this I I own both of these. In fact, Forbidden Planet I've bought twice. So once on DVD and once on fiftieth anniversary DVD. So <laughs> that's how much I like that film. All right. Uh, next one, nineteen sixty eight, Planet of the Apes. Classic Heston. Okay, that, that's the good Planet of the Apes. It is, it is. Uh, first time I saw this, I believe, was, maybe I was 20 years old, and the Space Channel here in Canada was finally a thing, and they were playing all the Planet of the Apes movies at, like, midnight. I remember the, when they did the, the giant run of all the Planet of the Apes movies, including all the direct-to-home video ones that came out much later. Yeah. Yeah, so it was like what twelve something once like you that. Once you get to once you get to the like really cheesy low budget, they're still using the masks from the first movie right. ones. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but I I'd, I'd heard of this movie. Uh, people have talked about it. I hadn't seen it until I was like twenty years old. And midnight is like way past my bedtime, Josh. But I stayed up to watch the thing till like two in the morning or whatever, and I freaking loved it. Mm-hmm. It's it's classic. It's uh, hilarious. It's got some great lines in it. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! It's got Nova, who's a beautiful mute creature. Um, I won't make any comments on that. But... Uh, I was going to say, that, that, that has sort of some all kinds of social commentary about <laughs> you there, Sean. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm not saying anything in regards to that. I'm not saying women should be mute or anything. But I, just in the film, she was mute and she was beautiful. So these are just things that describe her character. Mm. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, what else? We, we've got the spaceship, we've got the trek through the uh, the so desert. I did not like the spaceship design on that. The triangle thing? Yeah. Oh, how come? Because the, the delta wing is for aerodynamics. Yeah. You know what you don't need in space? Aerodynamics? Exactly. Yeah, but this is 1960s design, it doesn't matter. They, it, they didn't know. It, it, no, they knew! Maybe they didn't care, maybe they thought the visuals looked cool. Yeah, I know. Your your scientific accuracy drives you crazy. No, no. See, okay. I, I give them a lot of leeway because it's the 1960s sci-fi. Mm-hmm. But come on. A, a delta wing? Really? Why not? I don't know. Because you don't need a delta wing for space. But of course they were going to land later on a planet, so maybe they needed it for that. No, because you don't land your main spacecraft. You land a shuttle. That was their spacecraft and their shuttle all in one. That's all they had. It has bad design. Well, sure. And that's why they crashed in the year 3000 or something. No, no, it's much, much later than that. 3600 and something. It was like 2000 years after they left anyway. Yeah, it was, yeah, but that, that would have been 3900. Maybe it was 39. I can't remember. Probably later because the ship was sci-fi. I don't remember. Yeah, it's, it's like 2000 years after the 1960s anyway. Spoiler alert from a 50-year-old movie. From the beginning part of the movie? Right. It's not even like... A, a deep spoiler in the story that's it takes place yeah 2000 years from now and yeah it's just it's fun uh his his adventures his capture his escape you damn dirty apes take your paws off me you what is it what does he say at the end you uh you blew it up you not you morons but anyway whatever it was he says at the end 
of where he actually is so yeah I, I think they know about it by now you think they know you think I could yeah. say that I, uh, I think any movie that has more than a 30 years on it yeah. can't, you can't spoil because a whole generation has grown up realizing that uh, he's actually been in New York the whole time that's the thing coastlines don't fit well, it's 2000 years later and there was a nuclear coastline, war yeah, that, that doesn't matter that won't affect the coastlines that much you wouldn't think so but no. that doesn't matter it's, it's a cool visual because that's an island a fairly far out there island compared to the mainland because it's off of another island. Right. So, well, how can you run up the beaches to it? No idea. Right. I'm not sure how that works. So, it... It it, it, it logically doesn't fit, but it's a great reveal. One of the greatest reveals in cinema. All right. So, that's why it's on my list. Uh, and then we go all the way to 1977. Can you imagine what it is? Um... The Lily Rose. Uh, it's a 1977 production. It's this that's the one, right? Uh, I was always going to put it on my list, Josh. But of course, I had to pick Star Wars. Oh, of course. A New Hope. Although it wasn't called A New Hope when it came out. Star Wars. I don't know. It, well, it was called New Hope because it was called that in the scroll. But the scroll was added later, not in the original the theatrical release. No? No, it was added later. Huh? Yeah. Little uh, known facts about Star Wars. I thought the scroll was always there. It was never always there. They added it after. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know why, but that's the way it worked. But yeah, it's it's Star Wars. You've you've got uh, you've got your droids. You've you've got your princess. You've you've got your young hero. You've got this guy in a mask. It, it's the classic story. No, it's, it's a hero's tale. It is. It is. And I almost wasn't going to put it on my list because it's so obvious. Yeah, but it, it's it's your list of your favorite movies. It is. If it's your favorite movie, it's got to be on there. That's right. So, like, obviously, we're not going to see the the. Uh, the next movie in the sequence because we don't we don't do that on this only one movie for per franchise, but all right. So which of your of the the Star Wars movies was your favorite? Ah, uh, you know what? Like you're throwing New Hope on there because it's the chronological first. Yes, it started the whole thing. Right. But was it really your favorite? Well, when I when I think of Star Wars, I think of the Hoth battle scene from Empire Strikes Back. Okay. And the Adats because I love myself some Adats. As everybody knows. All right. Because, so. like, when I when I think Star Wars, the first scene that comes to me is the Battle of the Death Star. At the end of the first movie. Yeah. Right. So that's that's the first thing that comes to my mm -hmm. mind. Yeah. And then it's and then it's Darth Vader and then Luke staring at two suns, which should have driven him blind because he stared at two different suns at the same time. And that's not good for your eyes. It's definitely not good for your eyes. And he wasn't wearing sunglasses at all. No. So. Space sunglasses. It's, right. He was not wearing those. No. No. So he should have been blinded. He should have been. But he wasn't. No. Because it's sci-fi. And that's okay. Yeah. But yeah. So the Star Wars franchise, it's epic. The later ones from the 90s, not so much. But it's all part of the story. It's all the background. All so right. It's all good. That's what I have. All right. And then we jump all the way to 1984, where I have a two-way tie for favorite movies of that year. The first one, of course, The Last Starfighter. Yeah, I can't go wrong with The Last Starfighter. It's... It's great. It's uh, it's a relatable young man who's uh, trapped in a dead end life in a uh, trailer park, and all he has for fun is to play the last Starfighter video game, which he's great at. Reading Starfighter arcade game. Yeah, I call it a video game. Yeah. It, well, yeah, you're right. It's an arcade. It, it is. It's a video game, but it's an arcade machine. Yeah. Yeah, the console and the the box there and all that stuff. Yeah. Right, and uh, he has to help around the mobile trailer park and uh, fix people's cable or their plumbing or their electricity or whatever the heck it is that he has to fix that day. And he doesn't get a scholarship to go away to school, and he's just going to be stuck in a dead-end job forever. And he hates his life, and as he says, he lives in a, uh, a mobile home, which is kind of like a cave on wheels, but their cave never went anywhere. Great line. It's fantastic. Good lines from it. Uh, it's got a robot in it, the beta unit. It's got... Is he a robot? Well, he's got wires and stuff. Wouldn't you call him a robot? Yeah, in a way, but then again, he's also... Uh, he may be a cyborg, because he seems semi-organic. Well, that's true, and he, what they call him, a simuloid? Yeah. I think. So, yeah, not classic robot, more like an android. Yeah, because he looks like a person. But he's got the robot well, he's, Yeah, he starts out very not human. Yes. 
But he, he Lilo ends up looking perfectly human. Yes, yes, because he's just like a, a lumpy flesh bag at first. Yeah. And he has to incubate or grow or yeah. do whatever he has to do. Uh, so there's that, and uh, of course he's awkward because he doesn't know the social situations. So that's fun to see, the two Alexes. Uh, you get uh, space battles, uh, one of the first uses of CGI, which now when you buy it on Blu-ray, it looks horrendous. Oh, particularly if you, you watch the, the high-def version. Which I have. It, the, the camera work, the 1980s camera work, the, you have a sharp line between the background and the, the foreground. Yes. Because um, it's a bad upgrade to, to high-def. Because uh-huh. it's just 1980s to, to now, it's just not going to work well. And then those CGs, wow. It, right. Like, wow. It, yeah, it's, it's, like, uh, it's almost like the Asteroids game. It's almost that bad. You know what? I know kids that can do better. Yes, but back in 1984, this was state of the art. It, it was cutting edge. Yes. So you got to give them credit for that. Uh, and, and I watched it lots back in the day on TV and on VHS tapes and whatever, and it looked great. And did you, I like the design of the Starfighter. Yes. With the Death Blossom. Well, let's exclude the Death Blossom because that's a terrible tactical thing. It is because it drains all your energy. Yes, also, you're, you're spinning in one spot, and it's not like they have any defense against beam weapons. True. So you just stay far enough back and you just fire your beam weapon at them. Yes. Because they're going to be spinning for several minutes, and it's, it's just really easy to take them out. Mm-hmm. But while it does evoke the feeling of a fighter craft, yeah. with its rounded shape, for it's almost like a, a, the wings are almost like half circles. Yes. It doesn't go, oh, that's super aerodynamic. Right, which you don't need in space. Which you don't need in space. you got the four thrusters placed on the corners. Yeah. It looks well. Mm-hmm. It's a very well-designed craft. For, for a spacecraft, for, for particularly early 80s, that's a good design. Yeah. And the, uh, the weapons cockpit is similar to the, uh, the Millennium Falcon. I find, where you're in the chair and it moves and you have to do all that stuff. And I, I always watch those scenes and I'm like, I don't think I could shoot anything. Everything's moving too fast and you're all... I don't get why you're moving. Yeah. Like, that never made sense to me and both those m- movies have that. So... Like, I can understand even putting a screen in front of you and turning the screen, like, you're, you're yeah. shooting and the screen moves. Because mm-hmm. there's no reason to throw you around back and forth like that. And they both do that. And it, it makes no sense to me. I'm like, I, I, I couldn't handle that. I couldn't be a space fighter pilot guy, weapons officer, whatever. Yeah, it, it particularly because he's really good at it from the gunner's position. Yeah. In the video game where he's standing perfectly still. Right. You're going to bust the record. But it wasn't just any game. You have been recruited by the Shar League to defend the frontier against Zor and the Kodan Armada. So there's a big difference. Yeah. Uh, and another thing the film has, of course, is the giant floating holographic head. Oh, yep. Which is a classic of sci-fi from the 80s, which I love. Which I wanted to do a whole episode on. On the great giant floating heads? The great giant floating heads of 1980s sci-fi. 80s and 90s. That too, yeah. Because he had a lot of them in the 90s. He had the, all the whole Power Rangers first run. Exactly. Zord on. Yeah, so that, that would require a lot of research, and I've never bothered to look those all up. But... Uh, yeah, so Last Starfighter, I think it was this was on your list as well. It was. Yeah, and it's uh, it's fantastic. So 1984 had a two-way tie because we've got The Last Star- Starfighter and we also have The Terminator. Okay, yep, The Terminator's fantastic. It's fantastic. It's a... the, one of the few reverse cyborgs. Right. Yeah. Explain. Well, most cyborgs are organics that had machines attached to them. Yes. This is a reverse cyborg. It is a machine that had organics attached to it. That's right. And, and we've talked about the Terminator before, how it fits all the different categories of robot, cyborg, and android. Yeah. So it's, it's all three. It's all three in one in various states of its uh, construction. Yeah. So uh, Terminator, though, it's, uh, it started off the franchise, which got progressively worse after Terminator 2. But uh, we, we've got 1980s sci-fi again. We've got uh, classic actors of the sci-fi genre, like uh, Paul Winfield and Lance Henriksen, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. We've got Linda Hamilton. We've got uh, Michael Bean, who was in all kinds of things. Yeah, he was in quite a few good sci-fi films. Yep. 
Because yeah. he was in Aliens as well. Exactly. That's, that's a real classic. You know what? I totally forgot Aliens. It's not even on my list, but it, it could be. It does definitely gets an honorable mention. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, The Terminator. It's it's got everything I love. It's uh, it's, a, it's a chase movie. Uh, it is. Um, of course, quotable lines. I'll be back. Which you have to have. Very. But uh, like a lot of quotable lines from movies, they are often just slightly off. I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. You find? Yeah, most people get them just slightly off. Oh, yeah, like, Luke, I'm your father? Yeah. But no, it's, no, no I, I am, am your father. father. Yeah, but nobody knows that. No, well, no. Everybody knows it, but they all quote it wrong. They, they all so. quote it the other way. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's, it's like that. And, uh, of course, the music from the Terminator, da dum boom boom da dum You know, I can't do it, but... Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about it. Yeah, of course. Uh, and you've got your um, your battle scenes from the future when he's having his, his nap at the construction site. His PTSD. His PTSD dream. Yeah, so there's that. And you see uh, skulls being crushed and all the uh, laser weapons. And it's, just, it's a lot of fun. And it's a whole alternate uh, version of the future, which looks really scary. Yeah, I, I like those scenes. They're good. The only thing is that the, the energy weapons shouldn't be making noise. Yeah, but sound design for a movie. It'd be pretty boring if you didn't have it, I guess. No, because then you would just hear the screams of the people getting hit. True. And the sizzle of the flesh. So, so you think that would have been better? I can see if humans developed energy weapons, them putting in a machine into the gun that makes it make sound. Yeah. Simply because we expect it to make sound. Right, just like vacuums. They can make them quieter, but they don't. Because if they sound loud, that means they're working better. Yeah. So, like, I can see humans putting sound makers into their laser guns. Yeah. That would be perfectly reasonable. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it would be quiet. Yes. And why would a robot have something that makes sound? Uh, good question. Because they want efficiency. Right. And if and you stealth. can add a stealth function to your weapon, mm -hmm. where they may not hear it, why wouldn't you do that? I don't know. I never thought of that before. Yeah, but because uh, you have to deliberately add a sound maker to your gun to make it make a pew sound. <laughs> True, huh? Yeah, so. I guess you're right. Now, I'm, next time I watch it, I'm going to think of that. And, if you can find a copy, because I think I've seen this somewhere, where somebody took out took the out the, the laser sounds of the battle scene. Yeah, and it's just crush, crush, people yelling, but none of the laser sounds. Okay, and it was fantastic. That's what a, a battle should be. I, I think I have to find this version. But, uh, yeah, it, but The Terminator, one of the movies that, if I'm just going to sit down and watch a movie, I'll throw that on. That's a good movie. Because yeah. it's that good. Yeah. So. Then again, everything on this list should be that movie. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, Forbidden Planet, Time Machine, not so much. They're, they're, they're a mood one. But yeah. But you can sit down and watch uh, Planet of the Apes almost at any time, Star Wars, Last Starfighter, Terminator, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We are the Metal Geeks Podcast, and on this show, we have Heavy Metal... Comic books, video games, movies, theme parks, and more. Wait, wait, wait. Comics? Yep. And movies? Exactly. Video games? Yeah. Metal? Of course. How does theme parks fit in this? It just does. All of us Metal Geeks can be found at MetalGeeks.net. At Metal Geeks for Twitter. Metal Geeks on Instagram. And Metal Geeks on the Facey Space. You can also find us on iTunes. Subscribe today. Metal Geeks. And uh, we move on to 1986. So this is the smallest jump on your scale so far. You only went a year. I did. I did. Uh, so 1986 has Flight of the Navigator, which was on your list as well, I believe. It was, yeah. And it was near the top. Yes, exactly. And love Flight of the Navigator. Me too. It's just, it's, it's fantastic. I used to watch it uh, all the time back, back in the day. It was Sunday evening Disney Channel to you by Michael Eisner. Remember those days? Mm-hmm. Yeah, where he would introduce the film and whatever. And I don't know how many times I saw that as a kid. It's fantastic. It is one of the few futuristic sci-fis that take place in the past. Yes. And that is fantastic. Yes. Yes, it was awesome. It had the uh, the giant flying uh, silver football spaceship. It changed shape, right? <laughs> yeah, it was an adaptive design. Yeah, that was cool. Uh, it had the little creature that the guy, the kid got to take. Yeah, because his home world was blown up. Yeah, I always wanted that creature when I was a kid. I was like, why can't we have cool things like that? 
alien race from another you know, another star system. Yeah, like where's mine? Right. Why can't we all have a little exotic pet? So that was cool. Uh, the confusion that the kid had when he went back and forth in time and his parents and the kidnap and but he wasn't kidnapped and just everything about that film. It's great. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's it's just good childhood memories and uh, it it is not that great of a sci-fi because like some of the things are like all right. Really? Yeah, yeah, all right. Fine. Fine, we'll give you that. Well, it, it's, and it's a Disney movie. Yeah, but for what it was, for the age that I watched it, and the impact that it had on me, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it's... That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the best movie in the world to be on the list. No, it it's, has to be a movie that you enjoy. Yeah. I still watch it occasionally. Yeah. And I go, oh, it's fantastic. It's terrible design. Right. Yes. That wouldn't work that way, but it's too good. I can't, I can't. And I hadn't seen it in years, and I think last year you lent me your uh, DVD copy, and I sat down and watched it. I was like, "Oh, it's still good. It's cheesy as heck, but I love it." Oh yeah. So particularly because they're like, "Oh, this is the future," and I was like, <laughs> "No, no, that doesn't continue." No, exactly. And and I think they were on the NASA grounds, right? When uh, he was in the little room. Yeah. And he just climbed inside this little robot dog machine thing and he escaped delivery robot delivery yeah. robot and I'm like okay this doesn't make any sense like the security features are totally inaccurate but it works for the plot the big wave was Pepsi Clear it, was that in the thing that was one of the commercials she was like you want a Pepsi Clear oh nice okay yeah that's not another favorite thing is picking out all the uh, the ads yeah yeah that's fun okay and speaking of ads let's move up just a little bit to 1987 Josh mm. and what do we have one of the best robot films of all time. We've got Robocop. Not a robot film. It's a cyborg it's film. It's a cyborg film. But they couldn't call... I guess they could have called him Cyborg Cop, but it wouldn't have the same ring to Cyber it. Cop. Cyber Cop. Yeah. See, they could have. Cyber Cop would have worked. It, it would have. But I think Robocop just sounds better. Robocop does work better for, for the naming convention, but it, it's a cyborg. It is a cyborg. Yes. Because we've got Alex Murphy. But it does have the best robot of all time in there. The Ed 209. The Ed 209. Yes, it's a, it's a fantastic robot. Please put down your weapon. You have 20 seconds to comply. I, I, I love robots, Josh. I think that's why I called this podcast The Rusted Robot. What? Does that make sense? Well, now that you say it, maybe maybe that has something to do with it. Because how many of these films have robots in them, Josh? Uh, quite a few. Uh, so far, Forbidden Planet does. Yeah. Uh, Star Wars does. Uh, the yeah. last Starfighter does. The Terminator does. Uh, Fly the Nav- Navigator does. Does it? The ship. Oh, yeah, because it's an AI-based... And it, it's got the arm that comes out with the face on it. Right, that's true. So it, that's kind of a robot. So, yeah. Uh, and, of course, Robocop is a robot cyborg android movie. thing. Yeah. Movie. Yep, we've got all the stuff. Uh, we've got great lines. Come quietly or there will be trouble. Um, we've got political intrigue with the... Uh, with the executives at the office and how Robocop comes to be. Uh, we've got super duper violence. The main bad guy doesn't wash his hands. What? In that scene, yeah. he leaves the bathroom without washing his hands. Right. Yes. That's true. It's mm. kind of like, oh, yeah, you're definitely the bad guy. Well, yeah. The the main executive. Yeah. Yes. Who gets blown up real good at the end. Yeah. That, that was another thing from the 80s where you're always shooting guys out the window. Defenestration is cool. Yeah. Defenestration, right? Because fenetra is window in French, right? I'm not sure where the, the, the derivations of the etymology of the word comes from. What? You don't know. This is something you don't know? Well, no, I, I don't study the etymology of every word in the English language because it's too messed up because the English language is like, I'll steal that! Take this from here and take that from there. Yeah, you're right. And then we'll just m- mash it and twist it and break it and then we're, that's the way English works. Yeah, exactly. You write down... Read, read, lead, and lead. Right. You just have the same two words that written. You're, this is true. Wind and wind. Exactly. Same thing. There's so many. Minute minute. Exactly. Like, why? What? Welcome to the English Language Podcast Interlude. Yes. But back to Robocop, what, what else can I say about it? It's a futuristic take on Detroit from what? Like, I think it was like our time, like right now. Yeah. 30, in 30 years hence. So right around now sometime. So it was also first movie where there was nudity that I watched with my parents and they didn't like, oh, 
right? The, oh, the change room scene at the cop shop. Uh, I was thinking of more of the hookers. Yeah, I don't remember. You don't remember the hookers? I, I'm, no. The, the, the guy that made Robocop, he, he had the two hookers, and he was doing coke off the... Oh, yes, right. And then Red Foreman comes in and... Bitches, leave. <laughs> Gee, Bobby. Bye. You gonna call me? They run off and he gives them the grenade and all that whole scene. Right. Yes. I think I've been desensitized. So I can't even recall. So that was the first movie that I watched that had nudity with my parents. Okay. And that went okay. Yeah. I did. I was eight at the time. It's fine. Yeah. Eight is the perfect age to watch Robocop. (laughs) Why not, right? My dad thought so. We we rented it from the, the, the MGM rental place. Oh. Well, there you go. Uh, what else can I tell you about RoboCop? What can you tell me about RoboCop? Do you, how do you find it? It wasn't on your list, I don't believe, was it? I don't remember, but no. it's, it's a good film. I enjoyed it. It's fun. It's actiony. Yeah, it's got uh, everything you need. Murphy, it's it, you. It's, it's the Jesus analog. It is, because he gets re- re- resurrected. Yeah, of course. And, and he walks on water and all that jazz. That's true. We did talk about that, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, we did. I think so. Yep. Uh, and then it had uh, a couple sequels. Uh, two was okay uh, 3 was pretty bad and then the reboot from 2014 it's terrible you can't it's not the same movie it's not the same and meh yeah. but what makes Robocop great is it is a satire film in, in many ways it satires culture itself and it's got all the uh, the interludes with the films uh, the, the commercials, commercials yeah. and the news break which, and which is a, a Paul Verhoeven thing yeah he did that again in, in uh, Star Trek Troopers. Troopers yeah and, and it's it's a product of its time, and it it fits. And and I love how it's supposed to be, take place in our time now, but they're all TVs from like the seventies. Well, they couldn't predict flat screen television. Of course not. It's just it's cathode like, rays forever. That's John. Right, that's cathode right. rays forever. Cathode rays. I'm gonna get that tattooed on my forehead. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but it's it's great. It's fun. Uh, I, I could watch it like once a week if I wanted to. Yeah, it's a good film. It's it's just it's. Probably in my top three, maybe. So anyway, that's RoboCop. I'd buy that for a dollar. Yeah. I would. Uh, I never got the premise of that show. I've seen, like, the clips in the thing. Yeah. I never understood what the, the show is about. Uh. Because in some aspects, it seems like it's a comedy thing. Yeah. In other aspects, it seems like it's a game show. And I'm not too sure. I want to know what the show in the movie is about. Yeah. I want to know what I'd buy that for a dollar is. That's uh, one of the philosophical questions of our time. Very good. All right, let's move on to 1991, where we have a sequel, which is better than the original. It's Terminator 2. So this breaks the rules of the the listing. It does. I almost wasn't going to put on the first one, but I had to, because it's so good. But Terminator 2 ups the stakes, makes it better. It's more quotable. The CGI holds up 27 years later. It's because they didn't go too heavy on the CGI. They tried to be as subtle as they could when they made it. Yes, and, and they did. It's, it's just, it's fantastic. And I could put this right beside uh, Robocop in a, uh, in a movie lineup where you just watch them in an evening. So this is the first film in the Terminator tra- franchise that doesn't destroy the original timeline. It just continues. Because the first one destroys the original timeline by creating a loop, and that's fine. That's the movie. That's that's the whole thing. That's first it loop is fine. Yeah. It doesn't. It creates the the, the universe. It's fine. Mm-hmm. This one goes back in time, but it doesn't go back in time to the point where it changes the timeline. Exactly. So that's fine. We continue with our story of the movie with loops of time, but we don't have to deal with the loops. That's right. After this. That's where loops start going across things that shouldn't cross. Well, and that's partly because, of course, James Cameron directed one and two, and so it was his story, and he could do the whole thing. And then he abandoned it, or somebody else took over, or however ex- that happened. The executives had it. And it all fell apart. Because that what, what generally happens when executives have it. Yes, true. It all falls apart. But, yeah, so Terminator 2, uh, it, it ups the stakes... It uh, it introduces the T-1000, the liquid metal robot. Which I don't understand. You don't understand? So, liquid metal t- Terminator. It clearly states that you can't come back unless you're covered in organics. How did the liquid metal Terminator come back? I know. It came back in time, and it's liquid metal with a covering of flesh, but it can't be real flesh. 
because, because it's synthetic flesh. It's, it's just it's liquid metal shaping and recoloring itself to looks like. So maybe that's just one of the gimmies. But no, the the gimmies were already given in the first one. Time travel is possible, and here are the rules that are established for time travel. Yes, clearly. So this one here. <sighs> Also, it puts into place, like, okay, if you can cheat the system like that, why couldn't the original Terminator just bring a gun in his stomach, get here, cut open a stomach, and pull out a laser gun? He could have. Or a nuke. Something. Yeah, because clearly, from later films, uh, their power source is a little mini nuclear reactor. That's a microfusion power cell. Yeah, that. But I guess we don't talk about that in Terminator 2? I don't know. But anyway, uh, we've got uh, the great chase scene, we've got the highway, we've got the helicopter, we've, we've got uh, in the, uh, the factory where he gets... Oh, yeah, you have Lynn Hamilton and her sister, her twin sister, playing the same character, so they didn't have to do any kind of split-screen stuff. The, the effects are just amazing, mm-hmm. top-notch. Uh, it expands the mythology, and it makes us think that it's all over. And it should have been. And it, it was, should have been. It was the perfect ending. It was. It was. But then we had to make three, which was terrible. Yeah. And four. Salvation, which really didn't add anything. And then Genesis. The the cool thing about Genesis was how they did the shot-for-shot remakes in some of the scenes. That was awesome. Uh, the fact that they had John Connor be a nanite bad guy creature, that, that was pretty crappy. Yeah. Yeah. It, but it, it had some great uh, It also scenes. doesn't make sense, because like, the whole point... Of the last ditch time travel thing that started the whole thing off was that Skynet had lost. Yes. This is his last ditch, mm-hmm. throw the thing in back in time, and hopefully everything works out. Right. But if Skynet is, besides being an app now and changing the whole nature of the entire time mm-hmm. that things existed, is winning? Because he can just replicate himself into the next person in line? Yeah. Because once you're a nanite swarm, it's like, oh, I tapped you in the leg, now you're a nanite swarm too. It'll take a bit for you to get infected, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. I tapped you, I can run away and go tap somebody else. Yeah. And this is spreading like a zombie plague, except a rational, hyper-advanced zombie plague where the people can run really fast and have planned strategies, which they can coordinate over distance. Because ever is connected by the, the, the hive AI's high of mind. Yeah, yeah. Why did he send the thing back in time? Yeah, I don't know. They shouldn't have made Genesis at all. That was, that was a bad film. Yeah. It, it, cool scenes in some parts. I l- actually liked Salvation. Yeah. Because it, it it's doesn't deal with the time travel. This is all stuff in the future. Yes. Right? This is what's happening It's now. the future story. Mm-hmm. That's cool. We get to see some of what's happening in the future and how it works. Cool. And it's before the first event. Yeah. That's all fun. Mm-hmm. I I thought there were some aspects that I would have changed. Yeah. But overall, it was fine. And it even, it even had a good callback to number three, even though number three is terrible. Yes. Because it had the same T1s uh, in the, the sewers that they fought at the military base right. when she first activated them and took over. Yes. They had the same model in the basement. Yeah, that's true. So. So there's good connections between some of them. Though I enjoyed that one. Yeah. I didn't find it great compared yeah. to the other, the first two, no. but it was okay. It was okay. So I'd go two, one, four, salvation, three, and then five. Regenesis. Yeah. No, two, one, Sarah Connor Chronicles, the yes. TV show, uh-huh. then salvation, then three, and then Genesis. Genesis. Yeah, that, that sounds accurate. I would go with that list as well. Because the TV show was great, and yeah. it was cancelled before its time. Uh, <coughs> Fox. Fox. Right. So, yeah. But uh, going back to Terminator 2 on the list, it's... I just love it. Yeah, it's and I fantastic. And I watch it all the time. Lots of good quotes in that movie. So many good quotes. Yeah. It's got a great uh, Guns N' Roses soundtrack. The only thing about the quotes in that movie, you know they were written to be quotes. Oh, totally. Yeah, total fan service. Yeah. Yeah. And all we can do is look forward to the next James Cameron produced uh, film, Terminator 6, or whatever they're going to call it. Which I think it's Terminator 3. Because they're going to ignore everything else. They're going to reset the universe back to after 2. Which they need to do. But it's a time travel re- movie, which means those movies are still canon, in that they still existed, but because of time travel, we've erased that timeline. Alternate reality. So, yeah. 
That's the problem with time travel films. Things can get weird. Because the universe splits off. Yeah. Yes. So I'm looking forward to it. It comes out in 2019 or maybe 2020. I'm not 100% sure, sure or certain, but I will be in theaters to watch it. Which brings us to our next film on the list. It's from 1996, Star Trek First Contact. So this also breaks our rules because, much like Star Wars, there's a whole pile of Star Trek films in the franchise. Well, no, you didn't, you didn't call out Star Trek before this point. I didn't. No, so this can be you know, this can be your favorite in the Star Trek series. It that's, is. That's fine. It is. It's so. it's also the first Star Trek film that I got to see in theaters. Well, well yeah, that's good. So it uh, it's got my favorite crew, the Next Generation crew. Uh, it's got time travel. Of course, it's got robots because we've got Data. He's an android, but whatever. Um, what else have we got? We've got the Borg, which are great. Who? Oh, those bionic zombies you told me about? The Borg. Borg? Sounds Swedish. We introduce the Borg Queen, which is a contentious kind of thing, because some people say, oh, that's great, and some people say, that's a horrible idea. She doesn't make sense. She doesn't, because it's supposed to be a collective, and this is bringing order to chaos, but that doesn't make a whole... Yeah, because she is an individual personality within the collective. Yeah. But that doesn't make sense because it's a collective. The, it, whole, the whole power of it is to re- remove the hubris of the individual. Mm-hmm. That's right. But she and if she can of... come up with unique and and imaginative ideas, that's the whole problem with the collective is they can't come up with unique and, and imaginative ideas. Yeah. They just take what other people have done, refine it by using all the other stuff they already know, and like, oh, that's better now. Yeah. They can't come up with new stuff, no. but she can. She can. And if she can, then they don't need to be the Borg. And it makes no sense. Yeah. It all falls apart. So and we ignore that. We can even go, okay, she created the Borg and she's kept herself alive because whatever. But then she's recreated elsewhere. Yes. So introducing her here, we we can give her that one pass, like, okay, she created the first Borg. She started the collective of going, mm-hmm. okay. Because at this point in time, we didn't know much about the history of the Borg. Right. But now, no, it turns out she would, she joined the collective later because it's gone through several iterations and lots of stuff has been lost. But, of course, they needed a main antagonist to interact with uh, Data and Picard. Yeah. So that's why we have the Borg Queen. And one of the one of my favorite scenes in all of sci-fi is when her head comes down and attaches to her body, and it, you know, it's just it's great. It's so visually striking. When I saw that in the theater, I was like, "Holy crap, that's amazing!" It is visually striking, particularly the 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 spinal column swaying like a yes. swishing tail. Mm-hmm. It is visually striking. I'll give that. Yeah, and like the actress does portray a good menacing character. She does, but. Yeah, in, in context, it do, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit, but we've got uh, we've got time travel, we've got the evil threat, uh, we have the greatest stakes to save the future. Uh, we we've got Worf saying assimilate this and blowing up the uh, deflector dish, and uh, we've got people turning into z- zombie creatures. Uh, we've got Zephyr Cochran. Uh, it's just lots of good quotes. We've got the first scene here of Jordy with his new eyes. Ugh. He, he needs to put the hairband back on. You think so? Yeah. The banana clip? Yeah. Yeah. It needs to be in place. It's not Jordy without it. Yeah. The one the one thing I've always loved about Jordy, mm-hmm. because you can't see his eyes, yeah. you can't see his sarcasm. Right. Because you know at times, he's just rolling his eyes at what Picard says, but you can't see it. True enough. Because yeah. Picard makes some weird demands of him. Yes, he does. But that's what captains do to oh. engineers. They mm-hmm. go, do this in this time out of time, and he just rolls his eyes. All right, whatever. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's awesome. I, I, I went to the theater to see it as my first Star Trek film, and I, I do have a vague recollection of having tears in my eyes at parts of the story because it was so awesome. It was so overwhelming. I don't get very emotional at things, but this was, uh, it was just great. Okay. And I love it. Yeah, it's a fantastic yeah. movie. And even though there was some weird things about it where sometimes the ship has 24 decks and sometimes it has 29 decks, some, some continu- continuity problems, continuity problems. But uh, also, Yeah. But the ship was cool. Yeah. Uh, it was nicely aerodynamic for space travel, as you enjoy. <laughs> yeah. But we won't talk about that. It was just a lower, sleeker profile to fight the Borg. So there was less... Uh, 
area to be targeted by their weapons. Except they had a giant saucer. Well, there's that, but you need that to ram into the ship in the Nemesis movie. See, they're always thinking ahead, Josh. They're always thinking ahead. That's how Starfleet operates. They know what's coming. I, I've never gotten the saucer section. It, it just, they wanted the UFO look. That's probably what it was. Okay. All right, what's next? All right, the last film, number 10 on my list, is from 1999. It's not Star Trek, but it could be. It's Galaxy Quest. Okay, the spoof film. The spoof film. I just saw that uh, a couple weeks ago again. I love it. I could watch it all the time. Um, it's silly. Oh, it's very silly. But that's that's part of why it's so great. You know, they were talking about doing a sequel or a I, sequel TV show. I, yes. And I was like, why? Come on, get to it. Right? It would be amazing. Yeah. Even even if it was like the adventures of the, of the Galaxy Quest itself. Or the, the show within the show the gets show its own the, show? Yeah. Like, how awesome would that be? That, that would be hilarious to get a show within a show that has its own show. Yes. But this is also super quotable. It is? Uh, it's, does it have, I don't think it has robots. Um, no, but six of your movies have time travel. Do they? Yeah. Let's see. We've got uh, The Time Machine. Yeah. Planet of the Apes. No. Yeah, that's time travel. No. Time travel, that's just going forward in time. Everybody does that. It counts. No, it doesn't. All right, fine. Uh, Terminator. Yeah. Flight of the Navigator. Yeah. Terminator 2. Yeah. Star Trek. Yeah. First one. Yeah, you're right. Yep. I love time travel and robots, Josh. That's that's my thing. Those are my two favorite tropes of sci-fi, apparently. Uh, but back to Galaxy Quest. How many times have you seen it? Like a million, right? Uh, Galaxy Quest, of your list, is the one of the ones I've seen the least. Ah. It and the Time Machine are the ones I've seen the least. Okay. But, yeah, I enjoy it. It's funny. It didn't, get, didn't make my list, but I enjoyed it, and it's funny. Yeah. Because we've got the uh, the the, uh, the sci-fi convention where they're all at, and there's trouble between the crew. It's it's Shatner and his friends, of course. Uh, but I don't know what else to say about it. It's uh, it's fun. They actually go into space. Uh, some of the people are freaked out. There's comedy. There's uh, there's intrigue and there's uh, revenge. And actually, there is a bit of time travel in it too. That's uh, yeah. yeah. That's what I said. Six of your ten movies. You're right. You're right because they have the Omega Thirteen. Yeah, which is awesome, and it's got all the tropes of sci-fi because they're going through the battles of the ship, and there's the choppers, and there's the fire, and why would that be in your ship? That makes no sense. Yeah, but that's always happening in classic sci-fi, like all these traps and stuff. The the block of C four behind every council. Exactly, that's right. Yeah, so it's uh, it's just a lot of fun. It's an early uh, film with Justin Long, and he is a great actor. He he he's he's awesome. He's he's silly. He's I'll, he's, I'll, I'll beg to differ. He, he's great. He's like Shia LaBeouf. Yes, I would agree with that. I would put them in the same category. I would as well. Maybe not great actors, but they've got great comedic timing or something. I don't know what it is about those two guys. Uh, I enjoy... Okay, I'll, I'll give Justin Long a, a bump up above LaBeouf. Yeah. Uh, most of his films I enjoy more than I enjoy the LaBeouf films. Yes, yes, this is true. But they're not what I would call great actors. Well, no, they're not great actors, but they've got some skill. Yeah, so... But yeah, so Galaxy Quest, it's funny, it's got time travel, it's, uh, it's got space battles, it's good and quotable, just like everything else that I love, and I can watch it all the time. Alright. So, just to recap the list, we've got Forbidden Planet, The Time Machine, Planet of the Apes, Star Wars, The Last Starfighter, The Terminator, Flight of the Navigator, Robocop, Terminator 2, Star Trek First Contact, and Galaxy Quest. And then I have a whole bunch of uh, honorable mentions, of course. There's uh, there's Predator from 1987, which almost made the list. That's a pretty good one. Yeah, was... I would have bumped the original Terminator mm -hmm. off the list yeah. because you already have Terminator 2, the better of the two films. Yes, yes. And then then thrown Predator on because Predator is fantastic. Yeah, and of course we also have Aliens from Aliens is fantastic. Yeah. I could have put that on there. Totally forgot about it for some yeah. reason. Uh, and then both Vietnam movies. Yeah, you're right. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, I don't have everything written down, but uh, we've got Moon and District 9, both from 2009. Yeah, yeah they're both good from home. You've seen both of those? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ex Machina you've seen? I haven't seen Ex Machina. Oh, it's so good. It's it's slower, but it's got uh, both of the guys from uh, the new Star Wars films, Hux and uh, Poe Dameron. Okay, that does, that does not encourage me. No, but they're playing totally different characters. They're great. These these actors, they're fantastic. Uh, they might be, but... I also wanted to put Free Enterprise on the list. Have you seen it? 
No. Okay. This is from, I believe, 1998. It's not sci-fi per se. It's more of a uh, romantic comedy, but it's got William Shatner playing himself. It's got uh, Eric McCormick, the guy who plays Will from Will and Grace, and some other guy. And it's got a bit of, uh, not time travel per se, but flashbacks. And uh, William Shatner is this freaked out character, and he's trying to get a, a one-man play going of Julius Caesar. And uh, not the Eric McCormick guy. He's he's uptight. And uh, his, his friend that he always has to take care of is uh, a big sci-fi collector, and he's always uh, unlucky in love. But he's got all kinds of collectibles, and it's... It's fantastic. If you haven't seen Free Enterprise, you got to see it. Maybe. Oh, okay. I'll have to find that. It, it was one of those ones that I saw at Blockbuster years and years ago on VHS, and it was like four ninety nine or something. And I'm like, I've never heard of this film, and I, wa I looked at it for a couple weeks, and I finally bought it. And I'm like, this is friggin' amazing. It's it's not sci-fi per se, but it's got sci-fi elements. Or Well, it's like, uh, like fanboys. It, yeah, I would put those in the same viewing night. Those are the same thing. Yeah, because it's, it's about the thing that we enjoy. Yes. It's not the thing we enjoy, it's about the thing we enjoy. It's about the thing we enjoy. Okay. That's right. Yeah. So, so that, that was Sean's list. That's my list. Uh, breaking the rules that we established, but that's okay. Yeah, sometimes you have to break the rules. All right, so I don't know how we're going to wrap this up. We're just going to wrap it up by saying, go watch some films, get your own classic list of sci-fi, email your list to us. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll review your list and tell you why you're wrong. That's right. The, the rusted robot at gmail.com. Send us your list. Uh, and until next time, remember, it's your move, creep. Greetings, Starfighter. You have been selected by the Star League to defend the frontier against Zur and the Kodan Armada. Come with me if you want to live. I ain't got time to bleed. I would kill you if you were any other man. Hasta la vista, baby. You have been listening to the Rusted Robot Podcast. To contact the show, email therustedrobot at gmail.com or tweet us at therustedrobot. Join the Facebook page and group and visit the website at therustedrobot.podbean.com. The Rusted Robot podcast was put together by Sean and Josh and the Rusty crew. Please remember to check out our other show, the Soul Forge podcast, visit Jump City Comics in the 101 Mall, and leave a glowing review in your chosen podcast app. Thank you, and have a geeky day. The Rusted Robot podcast. Think about it. This is Media Break. You give us three minutes and we'll give you the world. Good morning. I'm Casey Wong with Jess Perkins. Top story, Pretoria. The threat of nuclear confrontation in South Africa escalated today when the ruling white military government of that besieged city-state unveiled a French-made neutron bomb and affirmed its willingness to use the three-megaton device as the city's last line of defense. And the president's first press conference from the Star Wars orbiting peace platform got off to a shaky start when power failed, causing a brief but harmless period of weightlessness for the visiting president and his staff. We'll be back in a moment. Is it time for that big operation? This may be the most important decision of your life. So come down and talk to one of our qualified surgeons. Here at the Family Heart Center, we feature the complete Jarvik line. Series 7 Sports Heart by Jensen. Yamaha, you pick the heart. Extended warranties, financing, qualifies for health tax credit. And remember, we care. Three dead police officers, one critically injured. Police union leaders blame Omni Consumer Products, OCP, the firm which recently entered into a contract with the city to fund and run the Detroit Metropolitan Police Department. Dick Jones, Division President, OCP. Every policeman knows when he joins the force that there are certain inherent risks that come with the territory. Ask any cop, he'll tell you. If you can't stand the heat, you better stay out of the kitchen. Although seriously wounded, Officer Frank Fredrickson escaped and identified this man. Clarence Bodiker, unofficial crime boss of old Detroit, now sought in connection with the deaths of 31 police officers. Today he's at large, while doctors at Henry Ford Memorial Hospital fight to save the life of Officer Frank Fredrickson. Good luck, Frank. Robocop, who is he? What is he? Where does he come from? 
He is OCP's newest soldier in their revolutionary crime management program. OCP spokesmen claim that the fearless machine has crooks on the run in old Detroit. Today, kids at Lee Iacocca Elementary School got to meet in person what their parents only read about in comic books. Robo, excuse me, Robo, any special message for all the kids watching at home? Ow. Stay out of trouble. More fighting in the Mexican crisis today when American troops participated in a joint raid with Mexican nationals against rebel rocket positions in Acapulco. Now this. Red alert. Red alert. Red alert. You crossed my line of death. You haven't dismantled your MX stockpile. Pakistan is threatening my border. That's it, Buster. No more military aid. <laughs> Nuke them. Get them before they get you. Another quality home game from Butler Brothers. Today, labor leaders agreed to sanction construction of OCP's Delta City, thereby creating an estimated one million much-needed new jobs, despite questions about workers' safety in dangerous old Detroit. Robert Morton, Vice President, Security Concepts, OCP. I'm afraid I can't comment on Delta City. That's not my division. But I will tell you this. At Security Concepts, we're projecting the end of crime in old Detroit within 40 days. There's a new guy in town. His name's Robocop. It's back. Big is back, because bigger is better. 6,000 SUX, an American tradition. Good evening. I'm Jess Perkins with Casey Wong. Top story, Santa Barbara. 10,000 acres of wooded residential land were scorched in an instant when a laser cannon aboard the Strategic Defense Peace Platform misfired today during routine startup tests. Casey? Yes, it was a day of mourning for the families of 113 people known dead at this hour, among them two former United States presidents who had retired in the Santa Barbara area. A day of mourning for a country. Police union representatives and OCP continue negotiations today in hopes of averting a citywide strike by police scheduled to begin tomorrow at midnight. Justin Ballard Watkins has more. They're still on duty, but what about tomorrow? That's the question we put to people in the crime-plagued Lexington area. They're public servants. They got job security. They're not supposed to strike. It's a free society. Except there ain't nothing free, because there's no guarantees, you know? <laughs> You're on your own. <laughs> there's a lot of jungle. <laughs> this has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping through Amazon.com or the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.